Uh, Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you that um, we're back in our rhythm. I thank you for the word. Lord, I don't know where I would be without it because it teaches me so much about you, my good shepherd. And Lord, I know what kind of sheep I am. I, I am not an inter- under any kind of illusion. It doesn't offend me to think that I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. And the fact that I need a very, very good, great shepherd. And so, God, I I pray that we would be reminded um, that our safety, that our protection, all has to do with our proximity to the good shepherd. So please, uh, Lord, help me to stay close and to follow your steps because you love me and I love you and I do recognize your voice. Help me have ears to hear it and not just ears to hear it, but a heart to love it and um, one that wants to obey it. So Lord, we love you. Teach us today through your word, John chapter 10. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember where we were in John chapter nine? And I told you, I think before you left, that John 10, at least the first uh, one through 21, I believe is connected with John chapter nine. I think it's still included in the Feast of the Tabernacles. It goes with that story, so that's how I'm gonna teach it. And so it is a continuation from the blind man. And do you remember how beautiful uh, that is? Jesus heals this blind man. Uh, He goes to the pool of Siloam, he washes, he, he obeys Jesus and he sees. And we had that whole interrogation scene where he's interrogated by his neighbors and he's interrogated by the religious leaders. And we have just the most beautiful example of what Jesus has been saying all the time. The light has come into the world. Some will choose to see. Some will choose not to and to walk away. And and for him, we giggled about the story when we went through it because to him, he's so amazed. It's so evident to him. It's amazing to me that you guys, you religious leaders, don't know where he's from And yet, he has restored my sight, and we know that no one in history has ever restored the sight of a blind man. And so, I don't know what to tell you. Um, Who do I think he is? Well, I think he's a prophet. It's evident that he is sent by God. His name is Jesus. Um, And so, I don't know why you can't see, but the simple truth is this. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. And when they said that, when he said that, and he professed of who he thought Jesus was, and then he questioned how they could not see, what did they do to him? They desynagogued him, right? They threw him out. They threw him out of the flock. And who went after him? The good shepherd. The good shepherd went out to find that lost sheep. And they have this whole discourse, and he says, he in the end says, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And so you have this picture of the good shepherd out collecting his sheep and pulling them in the flock, the true flock, and we're gonna continue that now as we look at John chapter 10. Oh, I, but I, I love the statement at the end of nine where it says, Um, that the Pharisees came to him and said, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say that we see, your guilt remains. Are we blind? He's like, no, that's the problem. You're not blind. You actually see, but you choose what? Not to believe. They don't see because they refuse to believe. That is the problem. And so we enter into the story of chapter 10. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Wow. 
There's a great deal of Old Testament um, references to God as the shepherd to back this up in the minds of the Jewish people. Um, I'll just give you a few. Genesis 48, 15 is when Jacob is blessing his sons before his death, and he says these words, the God who has been my shepherd all my days. So this picture of God being the good shepherd has been around from the beginning. Um, Psalm 28, nine, David says, be their shepherd and carry them forever. This idea of God being the shepherd. How about Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And not only did they have the idea that God was their shepherd, God had appointed leaders for them all along. For example, how about Moses, right? If you think about it, Moses led them. He led them to follow the law, but he led them through the wilderness like a shepherd with his staff. And he brought them to places of green pasture, and he brought them to places of food and water, and he was the idea of their great shepherd. And then when Moses retired, do you remember what he said? He says, who now will lead the people? And he actually uses um, the verbiage in Numbers 27. Uh, he asked for God to appoint a new leader to Israel so that Israel would not be like sheep without a shepherd. And so you have this idea that is like woven into the fabric of the Jewish life, this idea of shepherding. Um, yet the problem was the shepherds of Israel had what? They had failed. They were blind guides, if you remember. So I think that is so interesting where they say, are we blind too? What is the answer? Yeah, you are blind guides. You strain a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Have you ever known people like that? I probably am people like that. We might all be people like that. So much easier to see everybody else's junk. But I mean, sometimes it is just so evident. They argue and they strain a gnat, but yet in their attitudes and their love and their peace and their patience and their kindness, they, they swallow a camel. And so you have this idea of good shepherds and bad shepherds, which comes from what? I told you to hold the place. Ezekiel 34. Just to remind us, um, it says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, all shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. And so what does he say in verse 11? So, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. Do you see that any better than in, in John chapter nine? He was sent away out of the fold alone and who went and found that lost sheep? Jesus. We see this in the religious leaders who are about their own, they're all about their own power, control, and traditions more than they are about the sheep. I, I want you to understand that the law, according to Galatians, was like a schoolmaster, okay? It's referred to, the law is referred to as a guardian. Even the Old Testament sages referred to the law as fences, to keep them in, a set of parameters. Um, matter of fact, let's just look at Galatians. I want you to see it. And maybe I'll read it out of the message. Let me see. Go to Galatians 4. I get used to the real thing. And then I go try to find it in the message and it's paraphrased. It says, oh, it's this section. I'm like, well, I don't know what section to really start with. 
Um, I'll just read some out of Galatians 3 and into 4. Galatians 3, 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. <clears throat> now the promises were made to Abraham, to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Do you know what that means? He's talking about that the covenant of the law does not nullify or is not added to the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham was unconditional. And in Abraham, God promised him a seed, which is Christ Jesus. And what is gonna be, and through him, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And we're gonna see later on that what they never saw coming is that both Jew and Gentile would be put into Christ Jesus as one body, okay? And we're gonna look at that in a minute. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to who the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ may be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, this is the part I want you to hear. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian. Some of yours might say schoolmaster. Is there another word in anyone's Bible? Tutor, Tutor. good, I like that. What is it? Disciplinary, okay. So then the law was our guardian, our schoolmaster, our tutor, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heir according to the promise. All right? And so we're gonna look at this scripture even more. But the law was like a fence protecting them. That's why I always say it is impossible to legislate morality. Do you understand that? The more we try to legislate morality, the more fences we will have to put up. It's impossible. But the law was a guideline. Uh, I didn't even plan to talk about this, and it may not be a good example, but I taught in Christian school for a really long time. And I kind of saw this playing out, right? You would have laws and guidelines that would try to keep them safe. We do that for our young kids, right? Um, it's kind of a behavior modification. You would put things in there to protect them uh, from making horrible bad decisions that will impact their life. But somewhere along the way, in the minds of young people, it's almost like the schoolmaster becomes this idea of what Christianity is like. No, no, no. This is a school. It is an institution. It is here to teach you and to keep you safe and to run an institution, right? And so, but at some point, even in the home, when we do that with our kids, at some point, they have to mature into a faith that frees them from just the parameters and teaches them to walk in faith with Jesus, this makes sense because we're about to look at an analogy or a scene where the sheep are in a fence. And at some point, right? Because some people want to analyze and say the sheepfold is heaven here. I don't believe that for a split second. It's not heaven. If it was heaven, how can a thief come and steal you and, and all that? 
right? Or that, or that it's salvation. I don't think it represents salvation either because it says that we can come in and out. And I'm sorry, I am, I am a once saved, always saved girl. So I believe, I, I, I don't even understand knowing scripture how, how you can't believe that. So I believe it's Judaism. It's, it's the law. It's this fence that has protected them and it's had bad shepherds and now the good shepherd comes and calls you out because what has happened over time, it says this law has become a prison. And not only was it a spiritual prison because the law brought no life. Not only was it that, but it was also a prison to them because of how the religious leaders used it. They used the law to master over them and to control them. And that is what we're seeing here um, with these parameters. Basically, the religious leaders were saying, if you, want, if you won't bow to us and our teachings and our authority, then you are out. We will kick you out of the fold. So Jesus himself would go find him. Um, in order to understand this first section right here, you need to understand that there are two kinds of sheepfolds, okay? So this chapter is gonna talk about two types of sheepfolds. There is the sheepfold that is in the village, and there is the sheepfold that is in the country. This first one is referring to the sheepfold that was in the village, so in every village, when the shepherds would come in to their village after being out to pasture, there was one communal sheepfold. More than likely, it would have backed up to some kind of mountain or hill, and then they would have built three walls around it coming out, um, possibly stone walls, and then maybe even with like some kind of thicket at the top of it, but it would always have a gate. And at the gate, there would be a watchman. Uh, maybe they took turns, maybe it was an underling, but there would be a watchman. And so every night when the shepherds would come in, they would bring their flocks, all the flocks, and they would put them in a communal uh, sheepfold. And I love the fact that it, very often it says, if you look, that when the shepherds put their sheep in the flocks, they would have to pass under the rod. And so he would put the rod down so that each sheep would have to pass under. Why? Because he knew his sheep intimately. He was gonna ex inspect every sheep that came under that rod because you're about to go into a communal sheepfold. And if there's some kind of disease or something going on, you need to catch it and before it comes into all of the, the fold of sheep. And so it would come into this communal sheepfold and then the shepherds would go and get a good night's sleep and in the morning, they would come back, and when they would come back, the watchman would fully recognize the shepherd. He would come in the proper way, we're gonna look at this, and then he would call the sheep by name, and they recognized his voice. The first thing I want you to understand is says that he would go through the, the gate. He, he came the proper way. The watchman would recognize him, and the sheep would rec recognize his voice. He came the proper way. He did not cover, he did not come under the cover of night. He did not sneak. He came in full light for all to see. Why? Because he's the shepherd. That's why. The watchman would recognize him. He had the credentials, right? Galatians 4.4, 4, we were already there. And of course, I didn't stay there. Oh, look, I did it. Galatians 4.4, 4, this is what it reminded me of. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. What am I saying? Jesus came the proper way. He came in the fullness of time. He came the proper way through Judaism. He came in the proper way that he fulfilled over 300 prophecies that were about him. He came in the, proper to, in the proper way, in the proper light. He was the light of the world. He let himself be known. I mean, if you think about it, he was announced, he was presented, he was tested, 
He was witnessed about, right, by who? The scripture, by the Father through his works, by his disciples, by John the Baptist. The good shepherd came in the front door to call his sheep. He came in the front door of Judaism. He was the true shepherd. And it says, and when he comes in the, to the gate, that the sheep will hear his voice and he calls his own by name and he leads them out. They will recognize his voice. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a pretty cool thing because you do realize that sheep, they don't have brands, okay? They're not cattle. You can't tell the sheep apart just by looking at them. So how in the world will you know who the sheep belong to? And that's because when the shepherd speaks, his sheep raise their heads and they actually follow him. There is, they know the tone of his voice. They know what he sounds like. And so they lift their heads and they come to follow the shepherd. There was an old story that said, my daughter always calls me during Bible study. I know that's not funny to y'all, but I'm like, how long have I been teaching on Tuesday mornings? I don't know, but she, I've been trying to get a hold of her for three days. She's been ignoring her mother. And so she calls me every time in the middle of Tuesday. It's hilarious. And then I get off the, I, I leave here, I get in the car and I go, hey, Hill, what do I do on Tuesday mornings? Or, ah, I know it. I just always forget. So, um, but anyway, there was an old story about some shepherds. And this one shepherd was accusing another of stealing his sheep. And so he took him to court. And he goes to court and he's like, he has stolen my sheep. And they go back and forth, back and forth. The judge can't make up his mind. And he says, aha, I know. And so he tells someone who works for him, go get the sheep. And so they bring the sheep to the court and he says to the plaintiff, so they bring the sheep inside and they put the, the two men out in the hall. And he says, now tell the plaintiff to call the sheep. And so when he does, when he does his call, the sheep cower and look afraid. But the defendant, when he calls the sheep, the minute he calls the sheep, the sheep go out and follow him. That is how you know. I started thinking about it, it makes me laugh because we always had a call in our family. And uh, I don't know, for some reason now, I, it, ugh, it just makes me sick, but so long, it did not matter where you were. And if you were our friends, you knew the call. So half the time, if I was in Target and I couldn't find my kids who were old enough to be away from me, I did not lose my toddlers, okay, in Target. Um, but I would go, oh, ah, like that. That was our call. And my kids, if they heard, oh, ah, they would immediately come to me, okay, because I can't whistle. And so, but the funny thing is, is I would be in Target looking for those fools and I would be like, oh, and half my friends would come out of the thing, you know? And so that's kind of the idea that he would speak and they would recognize his voice. I love it. But it also makes you sad because it reminds you of other conversations that Jesus had with the religious leaders like, well, you don't recognize me because you don't know my father. You say that God is your father, but if you knew my father you would recognize me. I'm just like him. I sound just like him. The reason you don't know me is because my word has no place in you, he told them. They think God is their shepherd, but they don't recognize the voice of the good shepherd. It says that they recognize his voice and then he leads them out. Don't you love that? They're not branded, they're not prodded, they're not driven out. They are called and they are led. They follow, why? Because sheep have no idea where they're going. Is anybody else in here a little directionally challenged? <laughs> now we're better because Siri tells us everywhere to go, you know? But I remember the days we had to look at a map before we went out anywhere. You know, I followed many a map written on a napkin trying to get to somewhere. And uh, where I'm from, I mean, don't tell me north and south. Are you kidding me? You tell me, go two blocks, turn right at the Walmart, go down to Target, take a left. And at the barbecue place, I mean, like I'm a landmark kind of girl. 
but I'm not really great. Uh, I seem to always go a different direction. I had a friend who he used to always say, to be one of the smartest women I have ever known, you are so dumb when it comes to some of this kind of stuff. I mean, y'all, I ran in a 25K at night, my very first one, and at night, now it was at night, and I did have a headlamp on, so give me a little bit. But it was a two-lapper. The first one was 10 miles coming in, and I was kicking butt, and I was so happy, and they were like, you're doing great, Shannon, keep going, keep going. I had like six and a half miles to go. Well, the second lap, they told me, okay, it's a yellow lap and a blue lap. So I come around, and there's a T, and there's all these arrows that are colors, you know, at night. I thought I saw the blue one, and so I went around, and the thing is, I got in a group of people who were running good, and I come in, and I'm like, hmm, everybody's cheering. I came through the finish line, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not that fast. There is no way that was six miles. Well, come to find out, what? I went the wrong direction. After all of that nonsense, I get a do not finish. Listen, for somebody that's competitive, who's been training, and you have been training for 16 point whatever miles, and you, Kathy Gallo's laughing because she was there, and you come in, and you're an idiot, and you went 13 miles, it's frustrating. Why do we need a shepherd? Because half the time, what? We don't know. We're in the world we are going. And that is the point. Um, sheep are not that smart. They're prone to wonder. And it's funny when you teach about sheep not being smart and you give the analysis that we're sheep, some people accept it well and some people take offense. I think that's hilarious. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, David, King David, he didn't take offense. Why? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The entire chapter is a chapter of boasting about his great shepherd. Why do I love David so much? I love David because he is totally self-aware. In his life, he has become self-aware that he is not the sharpest tool in the shed. That he prones to what? Wonder. And he accepted that. And instead of boasting in himself, he boasted in his good shepherd. I believe that is the distinct difference between David and Saul. They were both a piece of work, if you study them. But the difference is David knew it. And he knew that he had a need for a good shepherd. And Saul, Saul never understood that, and he never bowed the knee. It is just this relationship of the sheep with the shepherd. And then he contrasts. He contrasts the shepherd with the thief. Did you see that? The thief does not come in the proper way. He sneaks in. Which I would say probably suggests that he does so under the cover of what? Of night, of darkness. And when he sneaks in, he's coming to steal. And did you see that it says that the sheep do not listen to a stranger's voice? Matter of fact, sheep are very scared of a strange voice. And most sheep, when they hear any kind of strange voice, you know what they do? They gather together. And sometimes they do so with all of their heads on the inside and their fannies outside. That's not good posture, okay, when there's an enemy right? You kind of need to see, but no, they cower and they're afraid and it makes them very vulnerable. They flee. So with that idea, you have this contrast picture of someone who comes in the improper way, who comes in in the cover of night, he comes in to steal, to grab, to snatch by force. It is not for the sheep's good, it's for their demise. Here's a principle for us. Sheep need a shepherd. Because without a shepherd, the sheep are either lost or dead. That's the bottom line. Sheep need a shepherd. 
Because without a shepherd, the sheep will become either lost or dead. Now in verse seven, it changes. Verse one through six, he says, I am the what? I'm the good shepherd. But starting in verse seven, the analogy changes and now he says, I am the door. So let's, let's look at that. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And I'm gonna tell you what, that's gonna be said four times in this passage. We're gonna look at it. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And once again, he says what? I lay down my life for the sheep. And he goes on to say, I have other sheep. And we're gonna look at that. But in this analogy, it changes. Now he is the door. Let me tell you why. Okay, remember how I told you there's two kinds of sheep folds? There's one in the village and then there's one out in the pasture lands. Sometimes they would go out and they'd take their sheep out to pasture and then at night they'd come in the village. But very often they would go out for days looking for pasture land. And when that happened, they would make a fold for their sheep on their own out in, and I'm sure there were some kind of already out there that they would make on their own. Now in this case, right, most of the time the walls would not be quite as high because they're making them out of stones and they put brush around. But the problem is they make this enclosement and actually there are books, I don't know if I wrote down his name, there's a guy, I think his name is George Smith, maybe George Adam Smith, and he writes uh, books about the culture back in those days. And he talks about how one day he went out um, to experience this, um, Eastern shepherds and what that was like. And he goes out and he sees one of these sheepfolds out in the wilderness and he looks and he goes, well, but where's the door? And the shepherd looks at him and says, I am the door. What does that mean? He literally lays down at the entrance of the sheepfold. And so what he is saying is he literally lays down his life. It is the sheep aren't coming in or out without stepping over me. And the wolf or the enemy can't come in without stepping over me. Have you ever heard the phrase over my dead body? All right. <laughs> As mothers, can we understand that? Oh, uh -uh. how many times have you placed yourself in harm's way because somebody was after one of your cubs? Oh, yes, yes, right? You're like, over my dead body, you get to my kid. I saw this one time play out when Zach was a little boy and uh, we were in Bisbee, Arizona, looking at uh, his dad's family's old property. And we, don't ask me why, but we had climbed over this fence because we had seen this donkey or whatever and we were looking at it and the donkey went off. Well, in a little bit, we kept hearing this bell, ding, 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 ding. And I'm like, what is that? And that there was a bell on this donkey and we look up and he is coming and behind him are coming a whole bunch of wild horses <laughs> and they are running. And I'm thinking, well, they're gonna stop. They're gonna stop. Those horses are gonna stop. <laughs> And I had Zachary on my hip and he's looking. We just kept looking over there and it was nothing but a field, but this one giant tree. And I remember, and immediately I'm thinking, yeah, they're not gonna stop. And so they got so close to us. And when, when it happened in one split second, this is what I saw take place. I took Zachary and I turned him towards the tree Doug stepped in and stood in front of me and his father stepped in and stood in front of him. And I thought, there you go. There it is. That's what we do, right? 
And so here you have this idea of the shepherd. He says, I am the door. I am the door. I will lay down my life for my sheep. This is an idea of protection and safety. And it is all about the proximity to the shepherd. You want security and safety? Then you better stay close to who? You better stay close to the shepherd. The key to being a happy sheep is proximity to the shepherd. So he says, I am the door. Did you notice he says, I am the door? There is only what? One, one door. That reminds you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I remember back in the day when I was teaching young people about the ark, Noah's ark, and boy, they loved this, right? And I was teaching them that it is a beautiful picture of salvation, that the ark is a picture of Jesus and, and salvation. And God had come to Noah. He showed grace on Noah, and he says, Noah, judgment is coming. If you want to be saved, obey me, right, and build the ark, and he builds the ark, and the beautiful thing is the ark is such a picture of Jesus. I mean, the wood is made out of acacia wood. It is a wood, or gopher wood in your Bible. It is a wood that is known not to decay. And in the desert lands, it produces thorns to protect itself. And so it's a picture there of the body of Christ who it says that the Holy One saw no decay because three days later he was risen. He died with the crown of thorns on his head and they were like, oh, you know. They're like, oh, I love it to teach young people because they look at you and they go, Phew, like, oh, you know. And I said, and it says that the ark was covered on the outside and the inside with pitch, but the Hebrew word is not the normal word for pitch. It's kafar and it literally means atonement. So you have the picture of the blood covering the outside and the inside. The wrath cannot come in because it's sealed with atonement. And I said, and isn't it interesting that everything about the ark has a dimension? You know, the, lit, the length, the width, the breadth, all of it. And I said, but the door doesn't. The door, we're not giving any dimension. Why? Because whosoever will may come. Doesn't matter how big you are, how small you are, what burden you're carrying, you are welcome in. And isn't it interesting, with all that needed to be put in that ark, I mean, come on, if I go to a buffet, I want two lines, right? Two doors would have been very helpful, but there's only what? One door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And he says, come into the ark. He was already in there and he shuts the door, right? And the fact is, there was no steering wheel, there was no udder, period. He led, we are in Christ Jesus, protected from the wrath, from the judgment. And there was only one window, basically it came across the top, right? They couldn't see out what was going on around, because what good would that be? You don't have any power to do anything about it. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so you have this beautiful idea, and he says, listen, I am the good shepherd. I came in the proper way through the front gate. I'm recognizable if you have eyes to see, and I call my sheep. And when I call my sheep, my sheep know my voice, and they will listen. And I don't drive them out because <laughs> they don't know where they're going. I lead the way. I am the good shepherd their safety and their security and their provision all have to do with the proximity of being around the shepherd. How good I am I? I am the door. I will lay down my life for my sheep. And I love the fact he once again contrasts uh, the thief. He says that there is one who will come that will steal, steal and kill and destroy but unlike him, I am the good shepherd. And my, my desire is to give you life. And not just any kind of life, but what? Abundant. Abundant life. How often do we get distracted by the things of the world for temporary pleasure? And the fact is, abundant life 
is to be close to the shepherd. It says he lays down his life for his sheep. And he says it four times. And that word for in the Greek is the Greek word huper. You wanna, I, I don't know if I know how to spell it. I think it's H-O-O-P. And it's pronounced like dash E-R with a little accent. Huper. And it literally means on behalf of or in place of. What is that? Substitutionary atonement. Listen, I can, uh, I can give liberty in a lot of areas in theology, but this would never be one. We are saved because of substitutionary atonement. The fact that the good shepherd laid down his life in place of, on behalf of his sheep. He came in the fullness of time under the law to fulfill the law, right? So that we might be freed and that we might no longer be slaves to the law, as Galatians said, but we would be adopted as sons of God. We are saved because Jesus died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins, and not only did he lay down his life, but what does he say later in this chapter? I will lay my life down and I will raise it up again. And when we come back um, in a couple weeks, we'll look at that even more. Um, You can tell the difference between the good shepherd and the thief in a second. You can tell the difference between a hireling and the good shepherd because the minute there is danger or cost, the hired hand will desert the sheep and will leave them to the wolves. Well, who does that remind you of? The Pharisees. The minute it's gonna cost them the minute they're insulted, the minute they have to lay down anything, their authority, their opinion, their power, whatever, they will throw that sheep to the wolves. But we have a good shepherd that decided you are worth everything that he would lay down his life for his sheep. When we come back, we're gonna look at uh, the rest of that story. We're gonna look at the fact that he talks about that he has other sheep, right? This is gonna blow their mind. This is the mystery that Paul talks about. This idea, this mystery, that he has other sheep that are gonna be brought into the same sheepfold. Paul says this is a mystery that nobody saw coming in the entire Old Testament. And really, it is our belief on this that impacts the way we see end time philosophy as well, is that we are brought into one body of Christ, both Jew and Gentile, that we are not only become the sons of God, but by faith, we become what is known as the sons of Abraham. And we're gonna look at that, all right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you for... uh, your word that reminds us that you're the good shepherd. You're gentle with your sheep. Sheep don't respond to harshness. We're afraid. We cower. But we know the beautiful sound of our shepherd's voice. Oh, you can be harsh, but you're not harsh with us. You're harsh with the enemy. God, I thank you for the rod. I thank you that at times I pass beneath the rod so that you can inspect me, see what's going on, heal me from wounds. God, I thank you that you are just so intimately acquainted with each sheep. I thank you, God, that you're willing to go after the one and leave the 99. Lord, I thank you that you are so willing to lay down your life for me in place of, on my behalf. And Lord, I thank you that you didn't just lay your life down, but that you raised it up again. What good is a shepherd who's laying dead around four dead wolves? You have promised me 
that you had the power to lay it down, you have the power to raise it up. And because of that, you can keep your promise as the good shepherd that you will never leave me nor forsake me. And God, I know that although you are seated at the right hand of the Father, you are still the good shepherd who is interceding on my behalf every day. So God, may I have ears to hear the voice of the good shepherd. A happy sheep will be in close proximity to her shepherd. We sure love you, and I thank you, God, that like the blind man, you were willing to come and find me. And that today I can say, I was blind, but now I see. We love you, in Jesus' name, amen.